Um, I'm extremely excited this evening to have uh, Nicholas de Monchot here. Nicholas is from um, California, where he's an assistant prof- professor, I think that's right, isn't yeah. it, yeah, at uh, the prestigious uh, Berkeley University. He's an assistant professor in architecture and urban design. Um, I first came across Nicholas's work on Building Blog, uh, where there was, as there, there usually is, a, a rather nice and in-depth review and uh, interview of uh, his book. And I subsequently bought the book and started uh, peddling it around the Bartlett, showing various people. But as usual, the kind of jet stream of uh, Building Blog had blown in before me and everybody had a copy. So uh, that was very interesting. But um, we've subsequently been involved in a few workshops and teaching events and... They've always been a particularly uh, enriching time, and partly this is because uh, he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of architecture and urban design and the usual stuff, but uh, also you have an encyclopedic knowledge of the lineages of uh, spaces and places and people and connections, rather like, uh, I think you're kind of rivaling someone like Peter Cook in that, in that respect. Um, anyway, I'm very, very pleased to have him here. I'm very uh, honoured to have him discuss his uh, book, spacesuit fashioning Apollo and uh, as you can see it's for sale afterwards over there, he might even sign it for you uh, might be worth a few bob on eBay if you do that <laughs> um, but, a few bob less on eBay <laughs> um, but I think um, spacesuit is a very significant publication and I, I think that for two reasons one it looks at aestheticising technology uh, discussing fashion and technology and the the seemingly very different cultures with ease and clarity throughout the book, which is great. And also, it reveals that seemingly technical problems don't always require uh, highly technologised responses. And I mean that in the the broadest sense, whether you're looking at um, uh, protocols or strategies or evaluated scientific research. And in this sense, describes technology as a very fluid and uh, magnetic force. Okay, thank you. Here's Nicholas. Well, uh, thanks, Mark, and thanks uh, for having me here at the Bartlett. Um, it's, uh, um, it's actually really great to be at the Bartlett giving this talk uh, for at least a couple of reasons. Um, uh, the first is an institutional connection, which uh, I'm already chatting people to, uh, to people today on, on how to revive, but there was actually a, a long-running exchange program between Berkeley and the Bartlett from uh, about 1958 to 1973, best, best as I can figure out, um, uh, which uh, pr- produced um, more than one uh, Berkeley-Bartlett marriage, I can report, uh, which is how I found out about it from people in the Bay Area. Um, and, uh, but I have a more, more personal uh, connection to, to the Bartlett. Um, uh, the, um, my father actually taught here in, uh, from 1961 to 1963. He's a, he's a planner, but he taught in architecture under Richard Llewellyn Davies. And then uh, my parents later met together working for uh, Llewellyn Davies on the plan for Milton Keynes. So I, I think I actually owe the Bartlett my very existence, amongst um, other things. Um, and uh, I was also, if, if that were not all, all enough, I, I was pleased to learn from my, my uncle Paul de Mancha this morning that my oldest cousin Stephen was born, I think, a few hundred meters up there uh, when this building was a, a maternity ward um, uh, back in the day. So, so it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here in particular, and it's a pleasure that all of you chose to spend uh, at least the early part of your Friday evening with me um, hearing about spacesuits instead of doing all the other things that one can do in London. Uh, so I should, uh, before I start in on the lecture, I'd like to make uh, one thing clear. I'm, I'm not a historian. Um, I'm not a, uh, or I'm not more than an amateur historian. I'm, I'm an architect, a practicing architect in, uh, in Oakland. Um, uh, this is one project uh, that uh, Mark and I have been uh, spoken together about, which is a, a, a set of um, uh, designed interventions for over 2,000 um, vacant publicly owned parcels in San Francisco, which has led to other studies. Here's a, an exhibit design uh, that just opened a collaboration with the cartoonist Daniel Klaus, um, uh, the Oakland Museum going to the MC, MCA in Chicago. Um, and so I, I really see myself as a practitioner. But um, if I turn to the topic of the, of the lecture, uh, I think uh, ideas and histories are not just important to the practice of design and the practice of architecture. I think they're potentially instrumental, especially in our current moment as we seek um, more than anything else to figure out how best to uh, uh, allow 
the uh, incredible forces of, uh, of information technology, territorial measurement, etc., to inform and alter um, our practice of design, even as the very media and tools we use to practice design are themselves being epochally and, uh, and also incrementally changed by those larger forces. So that's the real topic uh, uh, here tonight. But the other topic, or at least the major question of the evening, um, is about this object. This is one of the most reproduced images of the 20th century. And um, it contains an object in plain sight, which is actually very curious, which is the Apollo A7L spacesuit. And um, in this suit, only uh, on July 21st, 1969, on the surface of the moon, only 21 layers of fabric stood between the skin of Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and the um, uh, uh, lethal lunar vacuum of the moon. Many other proposals were made for this suit. Many more elegant, seemingly more elegant, seemingly more um, uh, uh, conceptually clear proposals. And these proposals were, of course, favored enormously, not just by the military industrial planners of the space race, but, the, um, uh, but even design historians since. This suit, uh, instead, was made not by a military industrial contractor, but was made by Playtex, the designer of bras and girdles. And instead of being designed and engineered from scratch, it was adapted, literally, from the, the, the rubber of the bras, the nylon trico of the bra straps, um, all assembled around the most uh, kind of prototypically masculine figure we can possibly imagine. Um, I don't know if they are playing this advertisement in Britain, but right now there's an antiperspirant ad in the States in which a fireman saves a, a, a woman from a building and they're about to kiss and then an astronaut walks down the street and she runs into his arms. So there's kind of the or, the or masculine figure um, uh, here clothed in uh, a modified girdle. This uh, also comes to the fundamental point of, the, of, uh, of, the, of what I'll try to present to you tonight. Um, in his late life uh, lambasting of technological organization, the Pentagon of Power, Lewis Mumford considers this image of Alan Shepard and his Mercury spacecraft, dubbing him encapsulated man. Here, Mumford announces, uh, is the archetypical proto-model of post-historic man, whose existence from birth to death would be conditioned by the mega machine and made to conform as in a space capsule to the minimal functional requirements of an equally minimal environment, all under remote control. To survive on the moon, he expands, he must be encased in an even more heavily insulated argument. Uh, the astronaut's spacesuit, he says, will be the only garment that machine-processed and machine-conditioned man will wear in comfort. And yet, actually, uh, I argue here that we, we should take a, a, a much different view of this spacesuit in particular, which is to say that, um, as seen here in a training exercise for Apollo 12, um, Alan Bean and Charles Conrad imagining that this, this uh, prototypical white room, control room interior is the surface of the moon, we see the suit as what I will argue tonight that it really is, not just a buffer between um, uh, the vacuum of outer space and the, and the condition of the human body, but even more crucially, and even more importantly, a buffer between the organizational and uh, machine reality of that control system uh, here uh, in the, visible in the drop ceilings and raised floors of the uh, computer room, uh, a buffer between that reality and the much different reality um, that we find under the skin of the human body. Now, to present this argument to you in, the, uh, in, the, in this lecture, as in the book, in a linear fashion would, uh, uh, I believe, uh, uh, kind of lethally flatten its complexity, the complexity and richness of the story. And so what I'm going to present to you instead tonight is not a single lecture, but 21 short lectures of which this uh, lengthening statement I'm currently engaged in is only the first. Number two, a definition of space. Now, the word space suit was first coined in 1962 as a, as a uh, co-joining of space and suit. Space being the extra, extra atmospheric environment hostile to man, and suit actually from, um, from the Latin to follow, as in uh, uh, sue, uh, pursue, and lawsuit. Um, but the, 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 the discovery of extra atmospheric space as a space hostile to the human body, is not a 21st century phenomenon, or even a 19th century phenomenon, it's actually an 18th century phenomenon, where not the first, but the second balloon flight ever experienced by man, of the uh, Professor Jacques Alexandre César Charles, actually rose to 10,000 feet above Paris in 1783. Um, Professor Charles complained of earaches and cold, 
and was so um, uh, uh, astonished and um, uh, dismayed by the reaction of his body to uh, altitude that he actually never flew again. Uh, in the 19th century, um, uh, 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 explorers such as these ones, uh, Glasher and Coxwell, took off from uh, Wolverhampton in 1862 uh, with even canisters of oxygen because they understood that the atmosphere uh, diminished as one rose up. But uh, as they discovered, uh, oxygen deprivation uh, not only impedes the body, but it also impedes the mind, and therefore their judgment was so clouded that they didn't actually uh, take the oxygen that they brought with them uh, and were um, left uh, paralyzed and uh, actually survived, but um, barely made it back to Earth. In 1927, when uh, U.S. Army Air Corps Captain Hawthorne Gray rose into the Illinois sky uh, to break the latest in a series of high-altitude records for the U.S. Army Air Forces, he wore 57 pounds of protecting clothing, um, uh, including an oxygen delivery system. And yet, the hostile environment uh, 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 that he met uh, trying to break his altitude record was such that his oxygen system uh, froze up and broke, and he also uh, died. And his citation for the Distinguished Flying Cross, um, in fact, noted that no doubt his courage was greater than his supply of oxygen. <laughs> So as the notion of air became increasingly rarefied, as the notions that there was a, a tangible and discrete limit to the, um, uh, the, the upper uh, environment of what we architects call space, that is the navigable, the space navigable and engage, uh, engaged by the human body, a different idea came to the fore. It was actually an idea first um, uh, mooted by Milton. Uh, and no lesser mouth than Satan's drops the phrase space with a capital S as he describes the void from which planets and later man arise. Space may produce new worlds, whereof so rife they went to fame in heaven that God ere long intended to create, and there implant a generation whom his choice regard should favor equal to the sons of heaven. And here, of course, we have the most fundamental con uh, uh, connotation of space in our contemporary world. Space as an actual boundary has many different definitions. 100,000 feet for rocket engineers, uh, 250,000 feet for aviators, but for physicians it's the most restrictive, uh, uh, about uh, 36,000 feet, above which humans survive only very briefly. But conversely, because space is defined consistently as the environment that we cannot engage without technology, whether aviation or medical technology or rocket technology or so forth, space also carries with it thus a connotation of mastery through technology. Technology in the context of space in fact very precisely imbues the human body with the connotation from Milton of angels or demons or, or creatures outside the bounds of the everyday. It is in fact a kind of inky backdrop against which we can see projected all our hopes, all our fears for technology's ability to both liberate and condemn us. Three, the new look. On February 12th, 1947, Harper's Bazaar editor Carmel Snow moved quickly through a crowded audience in Christian Dior's small Paris atelier and congratulated the designer on his first solo collection. The group of dresses with their flared hem, wasp waist, and tight bodices has become known as the new look. The phrase was actually coined by Snow, who quickly exclaimed to Dior, it's quite a revolution, dear Christian, your dresses have such a new look. The new look of Dior marked several shifts in post-war culture. Uh, most immediately, it marked the end of a closed world of couture fashion and the birth of what uh, the French critic and semiologist Roland Barthes later termed the fashion system, a complex series of networked relationships between designers, magazines, media, and consumers. Secondly, it marked a change in the, um, uh, in, in the actual business of fashion. Dior... Uh, with the success of the new look, was taken under the arms of the American uh, uh, retail magnet um, Stanley Marcus, founder of the Neiman Marcus chain, and introduced to the com complex economics of fashion. In, uh, 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 as a result, Dior not only uh, ran his couture chain, but also was the very first designer to also run a fashion business, marketing and labeling things like Dior belts, Dior socks, etc., etc., but a third impact of the revolutionary new look goes beyond the semi semiotics of fashion into the language of global culture. Here, the phrase new look came to stand not so much for the shifting shapes of Dior's 1947 dresses, but for an architecture even more ephemeral, that of post-war reality itself. From dressing gowns to government policy, the phrase new look 
moved beyond the power of post-war marketing to describe all those jarring elements that the media-rich, newly industrialized United States found itself confronting after 1945. In short, the new look became shorthand for the momentous shifts of post-war life that, as Dior himself observed, uh, uh, quote, we believe to be promising but disconcerting at first. Four, the new look in defense planning. Some six years after Christian Dior's debut collection, on December 14, 1953, Admiral Arthur W. Radford gave a speech to the National Press Club in Washington entitled, The New Look in Defense Planning. Um, Ad Admiral Radford was the chairman of um, Eisenhower's Joint Chief of Staff, and to try and uh, summarize what he was presenting, he was presenting a decision not by himself, but actually by the, um, a decision made uh, vetoing uh, the National Security Council by Eisenhower. And th this particular decision was the decision, uh, the momentous decision, to devote the post-war United States military establishment instead of to a large standing army, the kind that had won World War II, um, the decision was made in, in, the, in the kind of uh, uh, early uh, uh, shaded days of the Cold War to instead defend against the Soviet Union, not through men, but through technology. This decision, um, uh, uh, enshrined in National Security Memorandum 162-2 of October 30, 1953, became known as Eisenhower's New Look. And it involved the shifting of vast segments of the US economy into military-industrial development. Its most immediate result was the uh, expansion and elaboration of the atomic technology that came out of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project, the entirety of the Manhattan Project, was just the size, the administrative size of about 5% of the 1955 military establishment, to let you know how much it ballooned up. Um, with the, 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 the development of the hydrogen bomb was the very first uh, uh, result of this shift in policy, a vast increase in the power and scale of nuclear weapons that, as in this test, the Ivy Mike test of 1953, created a crater as deep as the Empire State Building and as wide as the length of Manhattan. But this enormous atomic firepower um, had one problem. Unlike the smaller nuclear bombs of the immediate post-war era, no airplane could drop a thing of this scale and survive the, the, the uh, resulting blast. There's no speed you could go at that would leave you uh, 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 basically unbaked by the uh, enormous radiation of the device. So it became instrumental not just to develop aircraft to, to fly higher and faster, but to develop a, a new kind of system, an intercontinental ballistic missile, to deliver such weapons to their source. But this caused another problem. The intercontinental, despite our, our perception of the atomic bomb as a highly complex thing, um, it is relatively straightforward compared to the complexities of a device like an intercontinental ballistic missile. To understand the complexities of a device of this scale, we only have to look at the first several years of ICBM development, which, were, which was initially subcontracted to the uh, American aerospace company Convair. Um, as shown in this photo, the first 20 launches ended in uh, launch pad explosions. But the cause of each one was different. Uh, uh, in one, for example, a, uh, uh, the resonant frequency of a turbo pump in the jet exhaust uh, corresponded precisely with that of a gyroscope on the top of the, uh, in the guidance system on the top of uh, uh, the rocket explosion. Uh, in another, the, the kind of pulses in fuel lines uh, were the same, uh, 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 had a different kind of resonance with uh, uh, the delivery of, 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 of oxygen and uh, uh, explosion. Uh, so one explosion after the other. And therefore, the, the system uh, whereby um, uh, uh, armaments and objects were, were developed for the US military had to fundamentally change. And uh, to, to kind of uh, illustrate this change, I would, I would talk about, um, for example, the very fact that the word system itself entered the vocabulary of uh, not only military industrial planning, but the culture of large. The word system was so unusual when uh, it was first uh, mooted as the name for the intercontinental ballistic missile system that a giant definition had to be given in this memorandum to the Joint Chiefs of Staff that talked about other kinds of systems, like the solar system or the Grand Central Railroad system. But this notion of an object as a system was incredibly unusual, and yet it became the momentous legacy of the ICBM development um, uh, uh, process. Its author, 
um, Bernard, the author of this development process, Bernard Schreiber, shown here on the left, was actually a, a failed architect. Um, or that is to say, he was an architect who couldn't find work in the Depression and instead entered the Air Force, where he became um, uh, swiftly, he swiftly rose, not so much for his skills uh, as a pilot, but for his administ administrative skills. And when Convair um, uh, successively failed in all these attempts to build a missile, it was Shriver who was tapped to go in and fix things. The organization that Shriver founded, the Western Development Division of the US Air Force uh, in Inglewood, California, itself incorporated another uh, organization, the consultancy of these two engineers, Dean Wooldridge and Simon Rama, who would later uh, found uh, the defense giant, uh, what would become the defense giant, T TRW. And together, these um, fellows developed a system, a design system for designing objects, whereby instead of designing prototypes, uh, the, the kind of X and Y prototypes that the Air Force was used to. Instead, the entire object was arrayed out in a control room as a collection of what became known as black boxes, uh, because the boxes that they used in this particular control room were black. And the idea was that the, the object was defined no longer by its performance or by its outline, but rather the, by the relationship between all these systems and subsystems, so they could be codified and regulated and avoid the kind of cascading interference that caused all these convoy disasters. But there were several um, unintended, uh, irrevocable, and almost geologically scaled consequences of this. The first, very subtle one, was, that, uh, was the arms race itself. Because once an object is no longer a thing, but rather a system, each with subsystems and subsystems that can each be constantly refined and upgraded, the object loses its status as a kind of finished thing and begins instead to be, a pro to be a, not a thing but a process of continual upgrading and improvement that led directly to the no enormous economic expenditure on both sides of the Cold War. Not only that, but the, if, a, a, if an object with different people and different expertises needs to be, if a, if a social structure uh, as it was in the Western Development Decision, needs to be uh, uh, created that mirrors the complex structure of this object, incorporating academic consultants, military, um, military brass, and uh, uh, um, uh, industrial contractors. What you get at the end of, this all, end of all of it is what Eisenhower himself uh, came was the first to term the military-industrial complex, a uh, massive connected enterprise of contractors, generals, and um, uh, fabricators and academics. Indeed, Eisenhower wanted to call it the military-industrial-academic complex, but his um, speechwriter said that was too long. Um, uh, that came um, to hold an enormous power um, over American society as a whole, and, and still does. As Eisenhower himself, who created this device, uh, was the first to recognize it was an enormously dangerous thing. Um, in his farewell address, um, he, he memorably uh, uh, warned that, quote, in the Council of Governments, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination in endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Five, flight in suits. The very first pressure suit ever created in the world was also the very first to appear on film. Uh, this is a still from the uh, uh, otherwise um, completely unmemorable 1932 film Air Hawks, released by um, uh, Columbia Pictures, in which the famed US aviator Wiley Post wears a suit that was designed for him by B.F. Goodrich, rubber and tire company, um, and completed only two weeks before the filming. In the film, they use the suit to fly at a um, uh, um, sufficient altitude to uh, uh, evade a uh, Professor Schatz's um, death ray. Uh, but in reality, Wiley Post uh, uh, deployed the suit to do something much more serious. Now, I want you actually to notice not just the, the clothes that Wiley Post was wearing in the previous picture, but the clothes that he's wearing in this picture. Unlike his colleagues in the barnstorming aviation culture of the 1930s, Wiley Post refused to wear jodhpurs and silk scarves and, and flying caps and, and to embrace the kind of swashbuckling um, uh, role of the, of the aviator. And instead, he always insisted on wearing business suits, along with uh, an eye patch. Uh, he had, in fact, been able to buy his first airplane with the insurance settlement from a mining accident in which he lost his eye. 
Um, and, and he, in this plane, this uh, spruce plane, the Winnie Mae, he set a number of high altitude and aviation records. Uh, uh, amongst, amongst other things, he discovered the jet stream, the, the west to east band of air encircling the earth um, at, in these high altitude flights. But he also noticed, as did um, the early balloonists, that his physiology rebelled enormously against these high altitudes. He would, uh, in breaking his uh, speed record across the United States, he would go to 35 or 36,000 feet for as long as he could stand it until blood was pouring from his ears and his uh, uh, nose and his mouth, and then he would come back down below the, the altitude line. But the jet stream allowed him to go fast. So as he was thinking about it, it was impossible to, to pressurize this plane. It would have made it too heavy. But he instead approached... Um, through his friend Jimmy Doolittle, the now uh, then, then working for the Defense Department, he approached the B.F. Goodrich Tire Company and uh, asked them to make him a quote-unquote tire in the shape of a man, in which he set several um, uh, high-altitude records. Uh, it took um, uh, technicians at the B.F. Goodrich suit several months to, uh, to actually perfect the suit, which almost totally immobilized uh, uh, post, but he could still um, uh, just work the, the, the kind of joystick uh, of the cockpit. And... Uh, um, uh, the, the New York Times um, uh, described the suit with, with great delight in a February 1935 article uh, just before Post would tragically die in a plane accident in Alaska and uh, uh, describing an engine failure um, in one of these uh, record attempts in 1935 the Times wrote, quote graceful as a seagull the Winnie Mae quietly dipped to the desert lake and slid along the only man nearby did not see the landing he was a motorist 400 yards distance tinkering with a bulky auto engine. Post, attired in his grotesque stratosphere flying suit with cylindrical helmet, climbed out of his ship and walked to the stalled motor car. He tapped the motorist on the back. The man's knees buckled and he almost fell over, said Post, describing the incident. The sight of me in this pressure chute with oxygen helmet was a little too much for his heart. He ran around to the back of his auto and peered at me. Finally, the words of Post restored the man's courage. Gosh, fellow, he exclaimed when he found his voice, I was frightened stiff. I thought you dropped out of the moon. <clears throat> Layer six, cyborg. The word cyborg first appeared in print on May, uh, May 22, 1960. On page 31 of the New York Times, an article, quote, Space Man is Seen as Man Machine, reported on an advanced copy of the proceedings of a symposium to be held several, later, several days later in San Antonio, Texas. The symposium was called Psychophysiological Aspects of Spaceflight. The Times article focused on the 27th paper of 28 in the proceedings. The paper in question, Drugs, Space, and Cybernetics, proposed not only a new vocabulary, the word cyborg, but also a new approach to the manned exploration of space. The newspaper explained as follows. A picture of the spaceman of the future has emerged from a radically new approach to the problems of space medicine. According to this view, a spaceman would be human and then some. He would not have to eat or breathe. Those functions and many others would be taken care of automatically by drugs and battery-powered devices built directly into his body. So equipped, the spaceman would belong to a breed of literally superhuman beings that the scientists who conceived them called cyborgs. So this word cyborg is so uh, prevalent in our contemporary culture that it's, um, to, to examine such a singular and bizarre or origin seems a little bit uncanny. But it was in fact invented by these two fellows, Nathan Klein and Manfred Klein. He was a psychopharmacologist and he was a cybernetic scientist. And they both worked here at the Rockland State Mental Hospital, a 10,000 uh, patient facility that had been completely revolutionized by uh, uh, Nathan Klein's uh, discovery of reserpine, the first antipsychotic medicine used in the United States, and ilpronazid, the first MAOI inhibitor uh, used to treat depression. Uh, on the crest of, uh, uh, of these discoveries, Rockland, along with other hospitals, radically um, deinstitutionalized, and a feeling of uh, a kind of control and mastery of the of the body, and the, and the, uh, uh, especially the kind of seeming extreme case of madness, was the uh, almost inevitable result. When the two came together, um, uh, Manfred Kleins, who had opened a biocybernetics laboratory at the hospital in uh, uh, 1958, dedicated to the science of control, the cyborg was the natural result. Um, uh, the the uh, initially chemical 
um, uh, running off of the, uh, uh, of the research on psychiatric drugs, it also became increasingly biomechanical. The result, uh, uh, not just of coverage, uh, resulting coverage, not just in the New York Times, but also here in Life magazine, and also um, million dollar studies by companies uh, like United Aircraft on this uh, seemingly inevitable modification of uh, the body for human spaceflight. There's many uh, uh, interesting stories contained in this, in this one, but the, the, the most interesting one um, uh, I find in, a, in, a, in the context of, of kind of gender that inevitably surrounds the, uh, this particular story was the um, uh, uh, mooted uh, suppression of sex drive in space, which, uh, as seen here in a, in a comic from uh, uh, Astronautics Magazine, was always talked about uh, in terms of uh, uh, somehow reducing the, the kind of... Uh, uh, uncontrollable influence of female astronauts, astronauts on male sexuality in space. But uh, even more fascinatingly, since it was also at the time uh, clearly understood that only men were going to go into space anytime soon, um, uh, it, it seems to me at least that the kind of uh, un, uh, uh, uncontrollable sexuality that people were afraid of was not so, uh, not so hetero, uh, as it were, but rather the, the potential of these astronauts to, in the kind of unknowable atmosphere of space, um, uh, uh, discover each other, as it were, in new ways. <laughs> Layer 7, bras in the battlefield. Without foundations, Christian Dior declared in 1953, there can be no fashion. And the foundations he was talking of were not architectural foundations, although Dior did often compare his dresses to architectural constructions, but rather the foundation garments that made the silhouette of the 1940s and 1950s possible. The chief uh, uh, vendor of these foundation garments, especially the new uh, latex girdles that replaced whalebone and <coughs> lace versions in the 1930s and 1940s, was the company Playtex, founded as the International Latex Corporation in Rochester, New York, but known best by its brand name, which was initially uh, came from the company's first product, uh, uh, rubber diaper covers for children. But crucially, um, uh, the company's founder, Abraham, Abram Spinell, always funded uh, at the peripheries of this uh, enormously success successful company, an R&D division, which initially focused on practical things like rubber boats for the army and, and uh, life jackets and so on and so forth. But uh, beginning in 1952, uh, based on the interests of its chief technician, chief technician is uh, maybe uh, too, too strong a word, uh, the chief technician, Lenny Shepard, was uh, uh, Spinell's former television repairman, who he hired um, because of his knack with vacuum tubes, um, uh, the, the, the chief interest, the seemingly uh, quixotic interest, was in the potential of a suit made of the latex and nylon of Playtex's um, uh, uh, bra and girdle products to not just allow a man to survive on the moon, but also do work there. And this um, uh, uh, work, which extended through the 1950s and 1960s in an isolated workshop in the so-called metals division of the, uh, of, of the company in Dover, Delaware, would lead directly to uh, uh, the Apollo spacesuit, um, although unexpectedly. And it also uh, would literally combine in the form of the rubber convoluted sections that made the Playtex spacesuit so mobile, the rubber molded latex of the girdle and the in-between holding these bands of uh, convolutes together, the nylon of uh, uh, literally borrowed from, from bra straps. Eight, man in space. According to a statement released by the Soviet Union's TASS News Service on April 12, 1961, quote, after the successful completion of a planned investigation and of the flight program, the Soviet spaceship Vostok made a safe landing at the predetermined place on April 12, 1961 at 10.55 Moscow time. The pilot cosmonaut Major Gagarin made the following statement, quote, I beg to report to the party to the government and to Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev personally that the landing was normal, that I am feeling well, and have sustained no injuries or disturbances. The accomplishment of a manned space flight opens grandiose perspectives for man's conquest of the cosmos. What was not revealed in the press release, and not actually revealed by the Russians at all until 1978, was the fact that Gagarin had landed not in this capsule, but in fact only in his spacesuit, ejecting at over 100,000 feet uh, uh, precisely because the, um, uh, the rocket 
uh, um, uh, slowed landing of the Soviet spacecraft necessary because United, the United States had dominion over the seas, that rocket-propelled landing mechanism um, was uh, not perfected and was deemed to be very likely to fail, uh, crushing the astronaut on, on his landing. And therefore, uh, for the first five Soviet space flights, the, uh, the cosmonaut ejected high in the altitude and landed separately. This was, in fact, why at the very last minute the, the letters CCCP were painted, hand-lettered on Gagarin's um, uh, 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 flight uh, 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 suit cowling because um, one of the launch engineers realized this was uh, only a few weeks after Francis Gary Powers had been shot down over the United States, that if Gagarin was unconscious and landed separately only in a space suit, he would not be taken for a Soviet cosmonaut because the program had been totally, therefore totally secret, but rather be assumed actually to be an American and potentially shot. Nine. JFK. John F. Kennedy's face is the centerpiece of a 1962 painting by the British pop artist, artist Richard Hamilton. Various technological elements, conduits, knobs, and switches float across the picture plane, divorced from their functional context. Kennedy stares outwards, fixing his gaze towards an uncertain void that visibly weighs upon his shoulders. To his right, behind the helmet's outline, the cross-section of a complex lens points away from his eyes. In the view of the, of the lens, at the very border of the frame, are printed the tiny Cyrillic initials CCCP. Okay. As he sought to respond to Gagarin's launch and its potential threat to the United States, John F. Kennedy relied on an understanding of, and even a control of, the image of his own body, which had been necessary since 1947, when Kennedy had been given uh, a few weeks to live by a British doctor before various other treatments for the innumerable maladies that plagued his body were discovered, such as uh, uh, the, the, the maladies he suffered included um, um, Addison's disease, a, a disorder of the adrenal system, several fused vertebrae in his spine, um, uh, a range of other uh, health problems, uh, including rampant venereal disease, that were all kept under check through highly secret medical treatments. Uh, all the way through Kennedy's presidency, um, uh, uh, but were, by the time of his presidency were so plaguing his body that in fact the Secret Service uh, had a betting pool as to not whether but when he would appear in public in the first, for the first time uh, in a wheelchair. Kennedy's intense consciousness of image, um, uh, grounded in, this, uh, uh, in the secret of his own medical condition, um, uh, which is in fact more dire uh, arguably than FDR's, led to an enormous focus on his own presentation. He would change his shirt up to five times a day, uh, and in fact, uh, 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 kind of endlessly maintained and controlled his own image to a degree which, of course, astounded and, and uh, blew away Richard Nixon in the 1960 election, but reflected uh, a very deep knowledge on Kennedy's own part of image and what it could do. As he sought to respond, to Gagarin's launch and the huge impact it had on the global imagination. Kennedy wrote to jo uh, Lyndon Johnson, seen here on the left, um, uh, uh, the titular head of the United States space efforts, asking, quote, do we have a chance of beating the Soviets by putting a laboratory in space, or by a trip out around the moon, or by a rocket to land on the moon, or a rocket to go to the moon and back with a man? Is there any other space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win? The committee that advised Lyndon Johnson on whether and how a US space effort could be made symmetrical or commensurate to Soviet efforts included not just Jerome Wiesner, the president's science advisor, but also Frank Stanton, the president of CBS. And Johnson's committee concluded that the manned landing on the moon was the only objective that would uh, have the potential to seize men's minds um, uh, through accomplishments in space. Only three weeks before Gagarin's launch, Kennedy had in fact proposed the defunding of US space efforts. But his post-Gagarin uh, understanding of the importance of uh, uh, the space achievements to the thickening complex of the Cold War resulted in a vast increase in funding, which meant that by 1966, more than 5% of the entire federal budget was going um, to NASA. Uh, and the, any under, uh, as a result, any understanding, certainly the understanding I had when I first came to this work of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs as kind of in incremental staged explorations, as they were called at the time, was totally false. Uh, uh, instead, 
the whole device, the whole organization, this vast military industrial complex covering 47 of the 48 uh, continental United States was a, was a single designed enterprise dedicated, as is our work, to the production of a single image, the spectacle of the United, uh, of a, uh, of a American man on the moon. Later that month, Kennedy began his second State of the Union address. Quote, the Constitution imposes upon me the obligation to, quote, from time to time give Congress information of the State of the Union. While this has been traditionally interpreted as an annual affair, the tradition has been broken in, in extraordinary times. These are extraordinary times. Later in the speech, Kennedy committed the country to its most incredible Cold War adventure, quote, sending a man to the moon and bringing him back alive before the end of this decade. From the perspective of Kennedy's knowledge of the media's power in the Cold War, as I've said, the entire effort to go to the moon should be rightly understood as an elaborate apparatus for the production of a single image. But Kennedy approved these plans because he, and perhaps particularly and peculiarly he, knew that such a single image, however arduously achieved, could be magnified and extended globally and in an instant change the world. Ten. Contractual physiology. Quote, your body lurches against the tight harness that straps you to the contour couch. Then you rotate faster and faster. It is a wild, sickening sensation. Your vision blurs. The cold sweat erupts. Writing in April 1960 in Life magazine, astronaut Gus Grissom describes his first-hand experience of one of the most impressive devices used to train and test the Mercury astronauts. This device, the Mastiff, or Multiple Axis Space Test Inertia Facility. Grissom's description reinforced the notion that early astronauts were operating at or near the limits of human performance, both in their missions and in the elaborate physical tests and simulations that they had undergone in training. In fact, however, this was never the case. Really, the reverse was true. In uh, secret tests from uh, the late 1940s to the 1950s, the United Air Force uh, uh, dedicated itself at its spatial periphery in the desert outside uh, uh, um, uh, um, Muroc Air, Air Force Base to a series of deliberate tests to precisely discover and enumerate the limits of human endurance. This fellow, John Paul Stapp, after whom the unit of human deceleration is named, um, uh, uh, subjected his, force, uh, his, his body at one, fourth, one point to over 25 uh, Gs of deceleration, going from 663 miles an hour to zero in a second. Um, he was unconscious um, for nine hours. Um, the entire front of his body was bruised, and uh, his sight took nine days to return. But he survived, and therefore found this limit, uh, and we were nice enough to name it after him, but the point is that these uh, uh, innumerable efforts that involved not just man testing but also animals after one particularly memorable um, test of a bunch of guinea pigs in a cage on a deceleration sled, um, uh, the, uh, well, it was not a cage actually, it was a metal box with just a few tiny air holes in them. Um, the, the guinea pigs were decelerated so quickly that not only did they not survive but any trace of them in the box didn't survive either. They had been entirely removed through the tiny hole. <coughs> Um, <laughs> this sense of limits, what was so interesting about these limits to the human body, as, as arduously and, and uh, dramatically and, and gorily as they, were, as they were attained, these limits were then the ones that were uh, uh, folded into the military industrial complex as it sought to not, um, uh, as it initially described, um, uh, uh, man rate, um, uh, uh, machine rate the men, that is, train the men to be able to manage the machines, but rather the problem was the reverse, um, man rating the machines, bringing the accelerations and arcs and, and, and manifold variables of ICBMs on which these astronauts sat within the range of human endurance and engagement. The military, however, allowed the myth of the superman, super endurance man to continue. Uh, because, of course, it favored the kind of propaganda value of the very first astronauts, all of them military men. They did so, at least, until 1962, when uh, Air Force contractor Randall Lovelace showed that not only were women um, uh, capable of withstanding the same uh, limits as men when it came to acceleration, deceleration, and so forth, but, in fact, they tested much better. 
And after this assertion, um, uh, a requirement was inserted into the uh, uh, astronaut contract that they be military test pilots, a category which incidentally uh, um, excluded women. Um, and the notion of the kind of super endurant, uh, uh, enduring ast astronaut was quietly sidelined. 11. Flight suit to space suit. So this is Alan Shepard's Mercury pressure suit as it exists today in a storm at the Smithsonian. And what is increasingly visible, literally, as the chemicals of the uh, suit's exterior uh, degrade and eat away at the kind of uh, uh, adhesive finish that connects this thin layer of aluminum to the outside of a military's pressure suit, what's increasingly revealed is the military origins of what we know as the spacesuit. The first pressure suits produced by the military were of this sort, made for uh, high altitude test pilots in the 1950s. This is not a pressure suit, uh, uh, or in the, in the sense of being a pressure vessel. It is a pressure suit in the sense of uh, actually uh, um, uh, putting mechanical pressure on the body so that it doesn't burst or, um, uh, 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 or boil. I, I should have said that 36,000 uh, foot line that I mentioned earlier, that's actually the uh, altitude at which uh, water boils at body temperature. So that is, uh, if you're above that uh, altitude with no, that's why they're so, um, uh, uh, I don't know, they're so laconic about it on aircraft. They say, oh, if this comes down, please put it on your face. But it's a serious thing, and, and you need to uh, be very aware of the effects of altitude on your body. So the first uh, efforts to, to, to restrain the body's tendency to, as I say, bo literally boil at this altitude were mechanical ones, um, resulting in suits like this. The creation of a pressure vessel around the body was, of course, came directly from posts tire like, made like a man in this suit. This prototype suit was made by the same um, engineer, Russell Colley, who made that suit for um, uh, post in the 1930s. This, uh, this uh, uh, suit was, of course, um, uh, could go much higher than those mechanical pressure suits because it literally created a new environment, but it was also incredibly difficult uh, to engineer. So the fundamental problem of the space, if I'm to, to uh, imagine a, a kind of soccer ball, uh, a pressurized rubber vessel. A pressurized rubber vessel wants to be two things. It wants to be very hard, like a ball inflated to its pressure. It also wants to be round to kind of equalize uh, pressure along the surface. And this desire of the, of the pressure suit to, to want to be round and hard is precisely the thing um, that, that uh, pressure suit design uh, came straight up against from the very beginning. The pressure suit wants to be shaped like a man. A man is not round. The most flexible part of a man, the hand, is especially unspherical. Um, and it also needs to be flexible, which is a very difficult thing to do. So these prototypes weren't so functional, but even as they floated out into the popular media, they, they led immediately to uh, uh, things like the Hergé pressure suit from uh, uh, Man Has Walked on the Moon. But as these suits were designed, they also led uh, and, and themselves engaged with popular culture. They also became artifacts of popular culture. And it was when um, the pressure suit, the prototype pressure suit made uh, by the David Clark Company for the X. Uh, 15 jet airplane uh, uh, project was scrubbed from the cover of Collier's magazine that a bright um, engineer at the company had the idea of instead of painting it a kind of, uh, having it be a kind of military gray green, they would instead make it silver. Um, uh, not for any functional necessity, although they maintained at the time it was for heat retention. That's this kind of photo of a poor guy in a, in a kind of a heat lamp uh, cabinet. Um, but it was, in fact, purely uh, uh, a cultural artifact. It was to precisely to make the suit look like a spacesuit, not like a military uh, flight suit, and to get it out into the media. And this uh, uh, notion of the silver spacesuit lasted for quite some time um, uh, until the very first American spacewalks, uh, when uh, the idea of a silver suit was um, uh, uh, deemed actually to be incredibly non-functional. It would be like um, uh, walking into a... Uh, uh, a kind of um, uh, tanning bed wearing a disco ball, right? If you imagine, it would really be uh, uh, that suits became white. Uh, and then, of course, back on Earth, uh, within about a month, all of Buck Rogers' costumes went uh, in the, on the television show from being silver to white as well. So there was this always, the, the, the spacesuit was always a cultural artifact, and there was always this kind of literal and material exchange between reality and science fiction. Yet functionality was still a huge issue. Uh, for all of the ability of a suit like this, the like space suits seen here on Ed White in the first American spacewalk, and here on, on um, uh, um, uh, J. 
Gene Cernan in the second American space suit, this suit was so exhausting to use and so uh, uncomfortable that when um, uh, Cernan got back to the ground, um, uh, the, the suit technicians emptied more than three liters of water from each of his suit legs that had accumulated there as a product of his own sweat and exertions inside the suit, and it had literally nowhere else to go. Layer 12, simulation. How does one do something, for uh, uh, train for something which hasn't been done yet? This was a fundamental problem of the space race. And it was a problem faced even as early as the 1930s and 1940s by the Air Force, which had been the first to commission uh, flight simulators or trainers, um, initially from the Link Company, a maker of pneumatic pipe organs, uh, for their ability to use these same uh, pneumatic technologies to equate uh, signals, just like the signals of a piano keyboard, to the actions of uh, pneumatic actuators within the um, uh, uh, plane body. Soon after these first analog simulators, though, the Air Force had the idea um, uh, that one it might be uh, uh, interesting or, or really useful to have a simulator that could simulate aircraft that had not yet been designed because those analog simulators had to be tuned to the performance of real objects. This led, not coincidentally, to the very first digital computer. This computer, the Whirlwind computer, which while it was uh, too complicated, costly, and uh, took too long to develop to ever actually be a flight simula simulator, formed instead the core of America's first air defense system, the Semi-Autonomous Ground Environment, or SAGE, which was not also, not incidentally, the very first um, um, computing device to spatialize and describe uh, contours and boundaries of, of territories and simulate their uh, and defend their attack by Russian bombers. The widespread uh, mistrust of computing on the part of the early Na astronaut and uh, uh, astronauts and engineers of NASA led, ironically, to their uh, extensive use throughout the uh, mission training for Apollo. The way Mercury, Gemini, and astronaut capsules were designed were, were to uh, aut autonomously control themselves through most of the mission profile, but to put the astronaut, quote, into the loop during an emergency. What this meant was that while the astronaut uh, would be okay for most of the, for, for a normal flight, there were, in the case of Apollo, more than 3,128 separate emergency conditions that needed to be trained for by each astronaut. This led to a vast increase in simulation hardware and, a, and an enormous uh, uh, burst in development of the ability to project reality virtually into the realm of actual space. Here is the, the um, uh, enormous glass optics uh, here and here of the uh, simulators that were designed for the command module, which is sort of embedded here in the, the lunar lander. These, Optics were so sophisticated, they actually simulated not only depth, but also parallax. You moved your head, and objects in the foreground moved more than ob objects in the background. Um, the simulation was initially done uh, using models and analog controls, but very quickly, as soon as 1964, switched to digital landscapes. This is, in fact, the very first digital virtual landscape ever encountered by mankind, a kind of... Uh, 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 a simulation of the surface of the moon, even very abstractly so, using a set system of crosses and, uh, and hatched patterns. Uh, the, the system was immediately adopted, uh, amongst others, by architects. I'll show you the product later. Um, and in particular, the uh, urban laboratory project of UCLA's School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, and in a, in a, in a comment in, in uh, 1970, its director, Peter Kamnitzer, remarked, we would like, using this technology, to put the designer in an environment where they could be exposed to a range of various futures. We will do this with computer simulation, which I believe will trigger the next creative leap in the human brain. 13. The moon suit plays football. In the middle of 1965, during a six-week burst of creativity in which they developed the essential prototype of the Apollo spacesuit that would go to the moon, a skeleton crew at the International Latex Corporation found themselves breaking into their own laboratories and storerooms. Working 24-hour shifts, a dozen engineers and technicians climbed partitions and picked locks to obtain supplies and records while the rest of the company slept. Most of these offices had been recently vacated by visitors from the Hamilton Standard Corporation, which had, uh, which had previously supervised 
um, uh, ILC or Playtex within the suit design realm. And this was all the result of the results of the 1962 request for proposal for a suit to allow a man to walk on the moon and do work. Not the emergency survival suits of the Air Force, but a suit in which uh, one could actually dwell. And this suit, uh, when this, uh, uh, this prototype, ILC's prototype that, that Len Shepard, the TV, re TV repairman, had been working on for seven years, this suit was so far ahead of any of the competitors in 1962 that NASA felt it had no choice but to select it. But it was incredibly uncomfortable selecting Playtex as its contractor, not just for the connotations uh, of gender and so forth that no doubt were sliding right below the surface, surface, but in literal terms for Playtex's total lack of, of experience and encounter with the uh, uh, management and design systems of systems engineering developed uh, uh, only if, uh, a decade earlier but now ubiquitous within the complexes of which NASA was a part. As a result, Playtex was hired, but only as a subcontractor to Hamilton Standard, who was seen as having the experience. But the clash of these two cultures was so enormous and so unproductive that by 1965, Hamilton Standard successfully petitioned uh, to fire uh, ILC with a, with, a, with a massive what they, uh, justification book containing correspondence of reli reliability reports, etc., etc. And what came out of that and out of NASA technicians' great faith in the Playtex suit was a competition, uh, a six-week competition in February of 1965 between Hamilton Standard, ILC, and the maker of Gemini suits. When the three suits were tested at the end of the six-week competition, the other two suits were found so inferior to the Playtex suit um, that in the words of, uh, uh, of Crew Systems Division, Matt Radofsky, uh, reporting to his superior at NASA, the ILC suit is in first place. There is no second place. In fact, the other suits were so incapable of dealing with the complexities of Apollo um, that, for example, when one suit was uh, uh, tested going up the, uh, climbing up the ladder of the, of the, um, uh, of the lunar lander, the, the buildup in pressure in the suit from bending the legs was so enormous that the helmet blew off, uh, uh, denting an enormous hole in the uh, NASA's ceiling and resulting in a very sternly worded memorandum about uh, testing safety. When the Hamilton Sanders suit was uh, tested in the lunar lander simulator, the, 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 the pilot managed to get out of the lunar lander just fine, but after uh, about a half an hour on the simulated, simulated lunar surface, the shoulders had expanded slowly so much that by the time he came up back the ladder, he just literally couldn't get back in. <laughs> As a result, um, uh, Playtex was hired as the prime contractor for the suit, directly subordinate to NASA, and made all of the Apollo suits, even those for the later Apollo missions, for which uh, more advanced hard prototypes were initially considered by NASA. <laughs> to defend itself against this poss possibility, um, uh, Playtex, uh, 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 and to confirm its own expertise, Playtex uh, uh, filmed in its own prototype second generation suit a um, uh, a test subject on the Dover High School uh, football field playing, um, uh, uh, I, I think not coincidentally, uh, a, a very masculine game and proving not incidentally the enormous mobility of this, of this suit, which was, uh, as I say, at the time pressurized um, much higher than the pressure even of, a, of, of the football itself. Fourteen, the handmade. So when a seamstress was taken off the regular bra and girdle assembly line of Playtex and brought into the spacesuit production shop, she would be, um, uh, often as not, taught to sew again from scratch. The seamstresses of ILC, the real heroes or heroines of this story, had to sew to 1 64th of an inch tolerance, only on one side of the seam, all without the use of pins that could uh, puncture or uh, uh, otherwise uh, damage the, the, the essential pressure vessel of the suit. The enormous, uh, 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 not only were the seamstresses in the end expected to perform to a level of craftsmanship, the likes of which has rarely been seen, I would argue, fitting each of these 21 layers, Russian doll-like, into the, one into the other, and stitching the entire suit on these uh, uh, standard senior sewing machines, but which were modified with a much larger arm so the whole suit could be moved around and rotated under the needle. The seamstresses of, uh, of ILC not only contributed to the craft of the suit, but they also contributed to its design. 
the, uh, chief, the, the supervisor of the suit production process, Len Shepard, would spend long nights, off until 3, 4, 5 in the morning, staying up with seamstresses, understanding precisely how the suit came together under each individual female hand and what improvements or augmentations the seamstress suggested in the suit's design and geometry in order to aid in its manufacture. The result um, was that the suit was a, a quintessentially a couture object, of which no drawings existed before it was made. When it was pointed out to, uh, uh, to ILC that a set of drawings of the suit were a contractual requirement of their relationship with NASA, the drawings were produced, but only as a kind of dissection of the suit as it was actually assembled. So these drawings, uh, as architects I would point out, that these drawings have a very different nature than that which we mostly uh, uh, encounter. That is, instead of projecting into the world something as it might be, they instead kind of enumerate or, or dissect the world as it is. They, are kind of, they have more in common with a city plan than they do a conventional architectural plan or section. The result uh, was, a, was a suit, here you see being modified uh, endlessly to fit each individual astronaut. But because of this, uh, the necessity of, of systems planning, ILC had a, a, an enormously difficult time producing not this object, but this object, the uh, so-called acceptance data pack, a kind of binder of paperwork, that, that, of systems engineering paperwork that followed the suit all the way through its process. And uh, uh, there, were, there were innumerable battles and conflicts with uh, ILC, not about the quality of the suit at all, but about the seeming uh, lack of quality in its paperwork, its inability to follow procedures, its, uh, uh, the con to the constant exasperation of the, the NASA managers who had to uh, encounter with it. And um, the, uh, the, the, the artifacts that were produced, were it, it later, even ILC later admitted, were a bit of a smokescreen, uh, hiding the kind of handcrafted and assembled nature of the suit from the managers which only had, who only had faith in a machine process. One of the most visible conflicts um, uh, was uh, uh, the, the NASA's requirement, as was the case in systems engineering, that every single time a part of the suit got modified, the suit itself had to acquire a brand new serial number. This was, of course, impossible because the suit was constantly being modified and adjusted to fit different parts of the, of the astronaut's geometry. Instead, in this case, ILC successfully uh, sued within the process to, uh, uh, instead of designating a different serial number for each modification, instead broadly uh, define each part of the suit by uh, a clothing designation, small, medium, or large, to distinguish it from, uh, uh, from the others. And this was carried out throughout the process, except in the case of the urinary collection device, which after an incident with the first astronaut fitted, was sized large, extra large, extra, extra large. <laughs> Fifteen, hard suit one. Playtex's chief competitor throughout this process, the suit that everyone thought American astronauts would wear on the surface of the moon, was engine, designed and engineered not by a clothing company, but by a large military industrial contractor, the Litton Engineering Company of Beverly Hills, California, who had initially made vac vacuum suits like this one to allow the live testing of vacuum tube components without the uh, emplacement of their glass bulb on top. With the advent of the space race and the enormous streams of funding that were, um, uh, uh, that, that were clearly becoming apparent, Litton quickly repurposed these vacuum suits into what it was the first to call spacesuits. Um, NASA released this image in 1962 with the caption, quote, nothing new under ye old sun. And certainly these suits uh, reflected a deep kind of preconception about the armored, hard, geometric uh, and refined reality that the, uh, uh, that the American astronaut on the, on the surface of the moon might have. Um, uh, I was especially intrigued to learn when I was looking into this history that the resemblance between uh, these suits and the costumes of Oscar Schlemmer's triadic ballet is more than just an aesthetic uh, 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 coincidence. It's, uh, in fact, joining the design team on these suits in 1958 was an Air Force engineer um, uh, named William Elkins who studied industrial design at the Chicago Bauhaus and was under the, the uh, concerted influence of several of Schlemmer's students. These suits, labeled RX by NASA for a, as a quote-unquote prescription for suit design, technically rigid experimental, but really something they had enormous faith in, were later quickly adapted for use not just by NASA, but by the nascent military space program, the Manned Orbiting Laboratory 
in which astronauts would have uh, worn these suits and been plugged in by this one uh, kind of um, enormously suggestively located socket <laughs> um, uh, from which they could be ejected quickly from the capsule. These suits were, were fated never to walk on the surface of the moon, but they continued, as in the 1970 World Fair Exposition in Osaka, to be the public face of US space travel. After going through this um, large building, which A. Louise Huxtable termed the world's largest bunion pad, one was confronted by the kind of panoply of American space artifacts, and uh, at the very end were not, the, uh, not a, a kind of image of Apollo, but rather the Lytton suits against the kind of half-tone image of the moon. Even though they had consistently failed in getting on board Apollo, they were uh, uh, used here as the, the, yet again as the kind of expected solid image of, uh, of mankind's inhabiting of the lunar surface. 16 we've got a signal. With an announcement by Mission Control, quote, we've got a signal, the first lunar television picture was broadcast. Above the astonishing caption, live from the surface of the moon, two black and white shapes resolved themselves into a blurry upside down picture of Neil Armstrong, paused on the lunar module's ladder. He had paused, in fact, to maneuver a complex apparatus that pulled a television camera out from the lunar descent module and trained it on himself. Armstrong waited for, for almost a minute one footstep above the lunar surface while, CB, while uh, NASA technicians perfected the image in order that the moment be precisely televised. In the, in the CBS broadcast of the landing, there followed a reaction shot of Walter Cronkite with tears streaming down his face. The CBS broadcast, the broadcast most viewed by not only Americans but everyone in the world recounting the lunar landing, was itself a throwback and a flash forward. On the one hand, it recapitulated a kind of complicity between media and government that was, by the end of the 1960s and the Vietnam era, already fraying and under siege. On the other hand, even as a relic of a now extinct media monoculture, the broadcast contains the germ of much of contemporary visual culture. Planning for the 31-hour CBS broadcast had gone back more than half a decade. At the same time as NASA had started to realize the limitations on its own lunar TV technology, CBS, CBS had come to understand that it could not in fact rely on NASA's own images. As a result, it developed its own extensive series of visual simulations involving, for example, a, uh, in this case, a uh, revolving rubber belt of the lunar surface uh, on which a, a kind of capsule was superimposed along with this lettering. To do this, they mastered, for, for the very first time, the chroma key, or green screen, now what's now known as green screen technology, uh, that ubiquitously influences our contemporary culture and has its direct origins in this single visual artifact. Not incidentally, the 31-hour TV broadcast radically stretched the limits and possibilities of television news. Previously, the CBS news broadcast had only been 15 minutes long. The result was an elaborately constructed stage set for the very first time for TV news. This stage set was called HAL 10,000 by the uh, CBS technicians because, uh, not incidentally, it had also been designed by Douglas Trumbull, the production designer for 2001. And it contained not just Cronkite, but a, a, a range of talking heads, clips dropped in, the kind of uh, extended um, uh, kind of interlocutory style of television that is, of course, now ubiquitous, but, by then, but at that point had never been seen before. And um, uh, uh, it, the, the resemblance was not just a family resemblance, because, in fact, Robert Whistler, who was producer of the CBS Lunar Television broadcast, uh, had uh, invented and mastered this art of continuous live television, um, became, with Ted Turner, the co-founder of CNN in 1980, crafting and therefore mastering a kind of uh, talking head visual culture that uh, was as novel then as it is now inescapable. 17, Hard Suit 2. I would never go into space in something made on a sewing machine, asserted uh, Vic Vickacol, lead designer of NASA's AX series of hard suits built at the Ames Research Center in California from 1963 onwards. These suits are particularly influential not just for their many technical innovations. They contain no um, uh, 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 moving parts, only sliding uh, uh, bushings and uh, uh, no seams uh, as conventionally um, uh, um, understood. They were influential not only for these technical innovations, which made their way into Lytton suits and others, but also for their outsized influence on design culture. In 1987, the critic Michael Sorkin, or the Time Critic, 
termed this, uh, this suit, the, the Ames AX3, the most be beautiful design object ever made. Uh, the, body, the body, in his terms, quote, both augmented and housed. The suits made a reappearance in uh, uh, the culture of space travel, not so much during the uh, 1970s Apollo era, but during the 1980s Star Wars era, where their entirely hard, uh, armored um, uh, um, uh, uh, quality was deemed a potential necessity for the sabotage missions on Russian satellites planned as part of Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, um, uh, although scrapped in, uh, in 1987. 18, control space. While Hubert Dreyfus and Charles Eames were contracted to the War Department uh, uh, of, the 19, uh, of, of the Second World War for work on visual displays, control rooms, and other uh, 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 um, spaces of, uh, of, of decision-making and display, this work was primarily theoretical. The real tangible origins of theaters of control, what would later be known as the control room, were in the literal theaters developed by the early uh, officers of the Strate Strategic Air Command in the late 1940s and 1950s to, uh, not, uh, to beam information about potential American movements and Soviet troops around to its network of, uh, of bases all along the northern frontier of the United States with, a, uh, uh, with uh, television cameras and the kind of stage set uh, 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 of uh, information display updated by hand. What happened over time, though, um, uh, interestingly, was as these theaters became more and more important to understand the theater as a war, these, these um, uh, windowless uh, rooms uh, with windows only on a world uh, virtual landscape of information, was that more and more offices and decision makers uh, uh, migrated into the room itself such that by the time a control room was imagined for the Apollo uh, uh, program, the very well-known mission control room um, uh, built in uh, 1962 in Houston, the, uh, the, 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 kind of theater, the stage set was complete, not just the screens at the front, but the desks uh, facing them on which all decisions uh, and information would be displayed. What's particularly interesting about these control rooms in the context of this larger story is that they were inescapable from the landscape of simulation, which I described earlier. In fact, the mission control room, which you've seen many times, I'm sure, on television, is not just a single child, but it's actually a twin. There are two identical control rooms, one on top of the other, built that way so that simulations could go on continuously in one room of upcoming missions while uh, uh, an actual mission could be accomplished in the room above. What was most disturbing to uh, occupants of the mission control building in the 1960s is that it was always impossible to tell which mission was real and which was fake because the mission only existed as a set of signals and information coming into the room. In fact, the, the, the mission control was not just a twin, it was actually a triplet because at the same time as mission control was built, this building was built, a kind of entombed Farnsworth house is what it looks like to me, but it's in fact the uh, skeleton of the uh, uh, identical copy of mission control built as the uh, North American Air Command under Cheyenne Mountain in Wyoming at the same time. This string of information going all the way, in fact, from the bodies of the astronauts to the screens of the uh, uh, mission controllers, this, this chain of military industrial information and control was only broken twice during the history of the, of the space race. Once during Apollo 13, when, as it's shown here, astronauts had to adapt using duct tape, a uh, filter from one part of the uh, spaceship to work on the other in order to save their own lives. Then they, uh, uh, not incidentally at the same time, chose to pull out and disconnect the re rectal thermometers and uh, EKG leads uh, uh, littering their bodies, uh, uh, kind of asserting their own autonomy in the face of the technology that threatened their own demise, and second, during um, what was known as the Skylab Rebellion of 1974, when astronauts on the third Skylab mission, after six weeks of following a 24-hour-a-day schedule of reports, activities, and uh, scheduled down to a five-minute interval, switched off all communication with the ground for 24 hours and chose instead to simply float and gaze at the Earth. So I hope you'll see again the point I made at the very beginning, which is to say that this strange object, the, the hand-designed, non-enumerated Apollo spacesuit, exists in this particular story of control, not just as a buffer in space, 
but a buffer in virtual space as well, between the logic of uh, the, the very human logic of the astronaut body and the very different systems, often virtual logic, of the interior office landscape. 19, cities and cyborgs. In remarks at the Smithsonian in 1968, American Vice President Hubert Humphrey declared, quote, the techniques that are going to put a man on the moon are going to be exactly the techniques that we are going to need to clean up our cities. Humphrey pointed especially to what he called the systems analysis approach. Now, 40 years later, we're used to the complexity of the idea of putting a man on the moon as a, as a kind of mechanism of comparison. If we can put on a man on the moon, why can't I get cell phone service in the middle of the city? But this was not Humphrey's point. Instead, he imagined the precise techniques of the space race, so seemingly successful in taming the complexity of this large-scale endeavor, as a proven panacea for the parallel problem, um, the most pressing problem in his mind of America and the United States, and that is the problem of the city. Most literally, this transposition was uh, visible in the co-opting of NASA and personnel into urban Programs. Literally, the, the, Apollo pro, the, the computers that were finished with their use in the Apollo program in 1968 were trundled down conversation, Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. into the basement of the rising Marcel Breuer HUD building to be used by HUD to simulate and, uh, uh, and understand urban scale problems. Um, but this was not the, but far from the only uh, comparison. This, uh, um, uh, there, were, there were summer schools, uh, transpositions of personnel, the director of nuclear propulsion for uh, uh, research for NASA became HUD's first director of science and technology. Uh, reports like this one uh, on science of the city coming out of a HUD, joint HUD-NASA uh, workshop uh, created, um, uh, literally um, uh, uh, laid out the comparison. Quote, Creating a safe, happy city is a greater challenge than a trip to the moon, it acknowledged, because urban housing is more complex than a rocket and the city is subject to more perturbations than the moon. However, these ever-changing problems can be attacked in the same logical way we have gone about exploring the universe. Here we see, uh, uh, the, the, as I, as I um, foreshadowed before, the lunar lander simul simulator used to produce what I've, uh, as far as I can figure out, is the very first ever architectural rendering made with this 256 edge technology, itself depicting not coincidentally a modernist intervention in downtown Los Angeles of raised piloti and elevated highways. Um, Bernard Shriver, who supervised the Atlas Missile Project, um, opened a consulting firm in 1968 uh, uh, called Urban Systems Associates, or USA, um, that, uh, for, to consult with government and industry. Rand, the, the Santa Monica think tank, opened up a sub-office in the New York City mayor's office. Um, and uh, as, I, as I spoke of before, um, uh, Howard Finger, formerly director of, space, of NASA's Nuclear Propulsion Office, where he designed this interplanetary nuclear spaceship used by Kubrick as the prototype for the discovery, um, became the first director of technology at HUD, where he attempted in a project called Operation Breakthrough to literally bring the technologies of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo into urban housing and, and placement. This program was, uh, uh, needless to say, rather unsuccessful, or maybe it does need to be said, the, 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 um, most of these communities failed when built. The, um, uh, as one, one uh, rather uh, memorable example, the uh, pneumatic sewage system developed for the Jersey City Operation Breakthrough site worked very well, but in reverse. <laughs> But the building technologies of Operation Breakthrough did ultimately find a very interesting and appropriate home. Not so much in uh, uh, the world on Earth, but the world as it continued to be imagined in space. Uh, in a 1973 uh, study uh, called Space Settlements, the Ames Research Center, in a parallel activity of the AX suit, identified systems for, uh, developed by Operation Breakthrough as, quote, especially suitable for building in space and appropriate to NASA's most grandiose projection of a 10,000-person uh, uh, community at Lagrange Point 3 between um, uh, the moon and the earth, quote, optimized by age, age and gender and settled by persons from Western industrialized nations, perfectly governed by, as the report proposed, quote, principles from government and industry. 20, 21 layers. So of course, the actual spacesuit worn on the surface of the moon um, was not an object of invention at all. 
It was, in fact, purely an object of adaptation. Of the 21 materials developed for the, uh, um, uh, the spacesuit, 20 of them were manufactured by the DuPont Chemical Company and originally intended for uses on Earth, where a single component of the ultimate suit's performance was uh, vital, like Nomex uh, for firefighters, uh, uh, Mylar for uh, insulation and, re and reflectivity, etc., etc. And in fact, even more interestingly, from a kind of evolutionary perspective, we can see that the 21-layered Apollo suit is just a natural descendant of a four-layer uh, Gemini spacesuit, which makes its way into a seven-layer spacesuit, which makes its way into a 21-layer Apollo suit, which is actually uh, 28 layers uh, by the, uh, the last Omega suits used during the uh, Apollo 14, 15, and 16 um, uh, missions. But don't worry, I'm basing my lecture structure on the 21-layer suit um, uh, tonight. But the the notion um, uh, espoused by evolutionary uh, biologists, which I think is particularly apt here, is a landscape not of invention, but uh, what the biologist Stuart Kaufman calls instead adjacent possibility. That is to say, taking something and remaking it to a new purpose. 21. Conclusion. Let me first congratulate you for your stamina. <laughs> Consider first a diagram here of the Apollo life support system is conceived and illustrated by Hamilton Standard Engineers in 60, 1964. And secondly, on the right, an X-ray mobility study of the ILC spacesuit performed by the Crew System Division in January of 1965. The fundamental differences between these two images return us to the essential question of my talk tonight, which is why, and perhaps now how, was the Apollo spacesuit soft? The first image is both uncharacteristic and also singularly representative of Apollo's interleaving military-industrial machinery. It is representative of Apollo in that it presents the human body as a streamlined outline, graphically receding in favor of a system of inputs, outputs, and cybernetic relationships of control. It is uncharacteristic because the human body is shown at the most extreme apogee of Apollo's journey to the moon in its lunar EVA. On the moon's surface, the body would be connected only to the portable light support system, or PLSS, this, the rest of this diagram, unfettered and physically autonomous from the vast infrastructure that was the foundation of its lunar trajectory. Now, the systems, uh, the, the cybernetic lens was conceived of in the 1940s and 1950s to, uh, uh, to, um, to, to examine and determine the relationship, the evolving relationship between humans and machine systems. Once cast, however, the cybernetic lens of systems management was used not just to peer out beyond the body, but also back into it, uh, uh, imagining the human body itself as a cybernetic system, controllable and manipulable just as surely as the systems designed ICBMs that lofted it to the moon. By contrast, however, this image uh, uh, reveals instead of a web of systematic relationships, rather a kind of specular feel, a slice of human body and spacesuit brought into focus on the surface of an X-ray. Here too, there's an equivalence of the natural and the man-made, as in the world of cybernetics, but as is perhaps in the nature of X-rays, the, the connection is more than skin deep. <coughs> a ghost captured by the machine the layered assemblage of the ILC spacesuit serves here as both a mechanism to protect the body, but also a kind of recapitulation of the body's own structure. Encapsulating the skeleton, it abandons the system's diagram in favor of the robust epidermal logic of the body it contained. An uncharacteristic image of astronaut John Young points further. Uncharacteristic because, as he poses in a David Clark Gemini spacesuit of 1963, he abandons the heroic masculine posture rhapsodized by Barth as the natural aspect of the jet man. Instead, he vamps. And the humor, of course, is in the incongruity, the masculinity of the fighter jock, the femininity of the pose. But there's even more here. A glance into the background of the image reveals a further organizational irony that resembles and reflects the humor of the pose. Arrayed behind Young is a collection of custom-fitted Mercury acceleration pouches here, uh, including his own. And it was only the provision of these custom-fitted chairs that allowed the system's design of the Mercury spacecraft to come between, to come within the Atlas missile, which it actually was, repurposed, acceleration parameters. 
Recapitulating the later logic of the Apollo spacesuit, these men of Mercury were then effectively mated to the Ur system of military industrial production, not through cybernetic control, but rather couture customization. Unlike any other part of the Mercury spacecraft, the couches were literally and figuratively fashioned, that is to say, custom fitted to each user and draped across their body in hard setting plaster bandage before being molded in fiberglass. In some settings, such as these couches, this juxtaposition between first principles and fashioning, the soft logic of the body and the hard logic of the system, can be seen as a collaboration. But it was also fundamentally a conflict. This basic conflict is especially visible in a June 21st, 1969 photograph of Neil Armstrong. Taken minutes after the conclusion of Apollo's uh, uh, EVA, 11's EVA, it shows Armstrong return to the relative safety of the lunar module, having unfastened his spacesuit helmet. Visibly elated, Armstrong is also clearly exhausted. In a manner that would especially plague later astronauts, the systems and schedules that transported him to the moon's surface did so in spite of, and not in sympathy with, the logic of his own body. Armstrong is shown radically extended, not in the cybernetic sense of augmentation, but in the literal sense of physical distance and physiological exhaustion. Set against the control switches and visual austerity of the Eagle capsule's interior is this essential conflict between electronic order and a robust intimate disorder that defines the special softness of spacesuit and spaceman. These two images can take us, I think, even a little bit further. On the left, in a 1951 Harper's Bazaar photograph, the model of Mary Jane Russell wearing one of the most extensive of new look dresses in front of the map of Turgot's uh, uh, 1739 map of Paris. Prepared prior to the radical surgery of Haussmann, the Turgot map is a particularly apt backdrop for the complex couture construction. In the other image, we see Apollo 17's Harrison Schmidt against the landscape of the human of the of the earth itself smith is of course pro uh, protected in particular by the uh, um, playtex spacesuit whose fundamental technology the convolutes as they were called also recalls conceptually and topologically um, walter benjamin's uh, uh, arcades project in which this word he gave particularly to the wandering meandering adapted pathways that we take not only through the city, but through, in that case, uh, a remarkable text as well. Now, if an image rivals AS11-45903, uh, Buzz Aldrin in, the, uh, uh, in his spacesuit, for its visual proliferation in our culture, it is this image, AS17-148-22727, the blue marble or whole earth. Yet, as with the Apollo spacesuit star turn, it is perhaps the intense reproduction of this image that hardens its surface to our view and helps obscure essential uh, uh, lessons of its content. Now, we are often told of the inspirational role that this image had in the, uh, uh, in the environmental movement. And by the way, I'm showing the image to you in its original orientation as it appears on the film, because, of course, it was uh, uh, taken from a spacecraft that had no sense of up and down. And it was taken from that spacecraft, the Apollo 17 command module, not so much to inspire the environmental movement, but actually to reflect it. The first Earth Day, after all, was in 1970. And this image wasn't taken until December of 1972. But the enormous declining interest in the by then uh, seemingly uh, practiced landing of Americans on the moon led NASA to make a range of kind of publicity uh, uh, attempts for the last missions. Not only did they schedule the EVAs for American prime time, much like the Olympics, but uh, in fact the, the kind of uh, advocacy of those like Stuart Brand, who were arguing for an image of the whole Earth uh, and had placed a kind of painted version of it on the first Earth Day flag, led NASA to, to a special trajectory for Apollo 17 uh, uh, to allow this photograph to be taken. If you'll bear with me for one last minute, brief lesson in orbital mechanics. We landed on the moon when the moon was in uh, surface was in oblique shadow, so we could see its relief. But if the moon is in oblique shadow, then the moon is half full, uh, because the sun is coming at it from the side. And if the moon is half full, then the earth is half full. So that's why we never saw a photograph of the whole earth until this special trajectory around the, uh, the kind of lighted side of the earth uh, deliberately allowed it. But the last lie of this image, the very, uh, the last, uh, one of the very last ideas I'll leave you, leave you with is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, this image is often used by uh, 
uh, even at the time it was used by uh, uh, those like Buckminster Fuller, who thought to explain the earth as a vast, perfect system. Uh, in his operating manual, manual of Spaceship Earth, on, on which this image uh, appears on the cover, the Earth is depicted uh, much uh, through a kind of systems engineering lens as a, a perfectly adapted enormous spaceship in which we're all hurtling through space, dependent on each other. And while it is true, we're certainly dependent on each other. The kind of spherical uh, uh, balloon-like hole of this image is really alive because, in fact, I would put it to you that although this is, in fact, of course, a very large sphere, uh, a, a kind of one sextillion ton lump of rock, we only really inhabit not the sphere, but the enormously thin epidermal membrane of the atmosphere at its periphery. And it is in this much smaller, much more uh, uh, liminal space that we have to fashion our future. It's been the aim of my talk here tonight to argue that the softness of the Apollo spacesuit is indicative of a special affinity between the bodies of Apollo astronauts and the spacesuits that protected them especially as differentiated from the remainder of Apollo's vast systems infrastructure. As such, this iconic image should project not, as is traditional, a mastery of nature through technology, but rather a necessary sympathy to those parts of nature that, like our own body, defy easy systemization. 25 years after walking on the surface of the moon, the normally reticent Neil Armstrong wrote his own letter of appreciation to the Apollo spacesuit and its makers. The suit, Armstrong wrote, quote, turned out to be one of the most widely photographed things in history. That was no doubt due to the fact that it was so photogenic. Its true beauty, however, he expounds, was that it worked. It was tough, reliable, and almost cuddly. <coughs> now, the very last argument I can possibly make to you for the affinity of this fashioned suit to the bodies for which it's fashioned um, comes from uh, not my own narrative, but the very remarkable fact, fact that I discovered at the Smithsonian, which is that when they come to Washington, the now dwindling elite alumni of Apollo do not, in fact, visit the vast cathedral to the space age of the Air and Space Museum on the Mall. Rather, they come quite regularly to an anonymous warehouse in, I kid you not, Suitland, Maryland, where the surviving Apollo spacesuits rest in storage. <coughs> Unlike the rest of Apollo's hardware, it is clear that Apollo astronauts regard the suit as extensions of their own selves. They, they, uh, they showed up all the time when I was there, wanting to make sure that they were well maintained and well taken care of. They see them not as hardware, not as the ship, not as the vehicle, not as the car, but rather as, as uh, 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 part of their own ever-changing life story. And indeed, the suits continue to change shape, size, and material as their living latex surfaces continue to adjust to the Earth's changing atmosphere. Even as it represents, however, a literal extension of a single Apollo astronaut's body, however, it is the lifelike quality of the Apollo spacesuit, its physical material and robust organization that makes it represent all of our bodies as well. As we gaze upon the fabric spacesuit, all of us can indeed look on the world with Apollo's gaze. Thank you very much. Thanks for your endurance. I'll, I'll, I'll say that Mark asked for, as he called it, the full Monty. So <laughs> that's what you got. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, I wanted to ask you about kind of another alternative narrative yeah. for the cycle, which is with reference to an evolution biologist from Berkeley, which is Don Harrow. Yes. And the fact that you are, you have this critique right. of yeah. And recently of species survival and yeah. extinction. Um, and this really is yeah. rethinking post human, right. which it seems to be all part of her project. Yeah. So, and also obviously the work with this feminine technology, right. which is both advanced yes. in the craft space yeah. and also based with the community and the individual. Yeah. So, I wanted to ask you what, well, whether she had been yeah. part of your. Um, conversations or thinking yeah. about or why she wasn't described or just if you could say yeah, yeah the, 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 um, 
Um, there's a, there's a, a kind of extended footnote in the book where I try and, and take this on. And Donna's is actually at Santa Cruz, which is, a, which is very close to Berkeley, but, but almost a world away in terms of its kind of free thinking history. But Donna's project, which for those of you who don't know it, is this kind of appropriation of the, of the notion of the cyborg for a kind of uh, a post human uh, uh, feminist, post uh, speciesist encounter with. Uh, uh, with it, and, and it's interesting. I, I find that project uh, really important and really interesting, and it connects to those the way in which a whole range of people, from Haraway to Stellar to others, have kind of taken on the notion of the cyborg as a kind of liberating influence. But what what uh, I think stymied me, and I found really interesting, but also stymied me in tackling it directly, was first of all the fact that the book had already become an enormously sprawling project, and they needed to rein it in. But also the the really interesting fact that those who who, um, that the project of the cyborg as a, a, a kind of emotional and physical liberation was there from the beginning. Actually, Manfred Kleins, the, the, um, the kind of co-inventor, he was, uh, 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 he's still alive, he's living actually also in the Bay Area, not kind of uh, coincidentally. He, he wrote a second essay on the cyborg, which he get, tried to give to uh, Astronautics Magazine in 1960, all about the emotional, spiritual, and sexual liberation of cyborg technology. And he, he, in fact, developed this cybernetic approach to emotional uh, science, which he called Centix, which, which got him, in fact, uh, hounded out of the Rockland State Hospital. And this, this is the kind of craziest sort of pseudoscientific uh, 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 stuff. The, the review of the book in the New York Times said, uh, I read every word, and I don't think I understand a single thing that Manfred Kleins is saying. But that's the kind of, uh, so, but, but the interesting thing about these, these so that there are all these texts from the very beginning <coughs> espousing the kind of political, social power of this notion of the cyborg. And the, uh, uh, all I sought to show in this book is that the, the cyborg idea from its origins contains both a notion of liberation and a notion of control. And that the, uh, like any kind of uh, um, uh, uh, sort of cultural artifact, it's impossible to extricate both of those from it. So I'm, I'm both enormously, uh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm mean, obviously unsurprised by a kind of continued narrative of liberation and continued appro appropriation and reappropriation of this notion, as I am equally kind of continuously skeptical about uh, uh, the the kind of um, the, the notion that uh, uh, that anything that has its roots in uh, uh, the kind of uh, the kind of deep DNA of our current technology, which are roots of, of, of attempts to control, simulate, and, and uh, master reality in a way that fundamentally cannot, cannot be mastered, may, makes me skeptical, not so much of the sentiment, because we've done this really important, really smart, um, uh, significant uh, contributor, but it makes me skeptical of the vocabulary. Uh, the the wor words have meanings, and meanings uh, uh, can be modified, but not fundamentally changed. And the word, as I say, has its origins in, in this very precise notion to, to uh, that the human body itself was no more than a collection of, of mechanical, of, of, you know, electromechanical chemical parts. That that uh, and and that's a notion that I think is, uh, um, you know, something to for, for which an enduring skepticism is is is, is justified. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a really um, wonderful story, and I I was wondering, sort of continue the conversation yeah. about uh, the relationship between architecture and, yeah. and, and the development of the suit. I was wondering um, about your reflection on how um, this softness or softening yeah. of the architecture of kind of a military industrial right. country um, impacted architecture and how yeah. suddenly we go, in the US in particular, we yeah. become very interested in um, mobile right. uh, cells and, and units. And, Sort of transformation from the uh, airstream and trailer yeah. to things like um, Archigram and, right. and uh, Ant Farms um, inflatables. Right. So the architecture suddenly becomes this soft yeah. uh, skin. Well, that's a really interesting uh, question because, in fact, the the um, one alternate version of this lecture that I was going to give showed uh, uh, talks in, in a kind of quite detailed fashion about the difference between of the influence of the space race on architectural culture in Britain and in the United States. Which is to say, in Britain you have like the, the February, it's February 1967 edition of AD, entirely devoted to space work. Uh, uh, essays by John McHale and, and, and others on, on all these ideas of, 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 kind of control and capsulality and, and 
inflatables and, and uh, the kind of all the machinery and bits and governs of the, of the space race was kind of embraced and, and, and attacked also by the by others, you know, for its kind of, uh, uh, um, um, the, the, for, for its architectural possibilities. Amparm is actually an really interesting exception in the American context. Uh, uh, and Amparm wasn't getting a lot of press in architectural uh, um, uh, magazines at the time. What, what completely uh, ubiquitously filled American architecture magazines that came from the space program was systems engineering. And as you know, Eric Hans, all these uh, others who, who kind of held up systems planning as kind of quintessential, uh, 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 as, as the most important legacy of the space program, and as the thing which then should be immediately applied in multiple scales to design schools, to design communities, to design it. Uh, and so it's the American architects focus on the means and, and uh, 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 on the ends rather, on the kind of perceived functionality, and, and uh, British and European architects fo focus on the objects. And the artifacts, and I think it's particularly interesting to me because at the time, I, you know, I, I, it's embarrassing to say how long this book took me, but it, it was basically working on it for, for ten years, from from uh, 2002 to uh, for ten years, 2001 to 2011. And the the in that time, that embarrassing long time, it was really interesting because I, I I expected to first when I started the book to kind of be talking about soft and hard and system and, and, and body as a kind of uh, object lesson to say, you know, this is how, because, uh, 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 but then, then two things happened. First of all, I uncovered the kind of uh, intense and fascinating history of direct intellectual connections between the disciplines of architecture and planning. My own university at Berkeley, there was a summer school held by uh, NASA and, and the Berkeley College of Environmental Design to retrain systems engineers from NASA, who were being, uh, as NASA was defunded post Apollo, for new jobs in urban administration. So like, you don't have to make it, it's happening in my office, right? You know, the 347 Worcester Hall was the office of one of the people running this program, and that's where the book was written. So that was you know, re remarkable as a kind of uh, set of connections. Then the other really interesting thing that happened was within architectural culture, which if you can you know, cast your mind back that, that far by 2001, was, was in 2001 was interested in uh, Still, kind of in the kind of post 90s interest in we went for a tour. We were interested in architectural culture from 2001 to 2011, especially in the United States, uh, but also here in the in the UK. Became deeply fascinated by uh, by systems logic, and they, they uh, and we call it parametric uh, 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 work today. But that's a, the, 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 the the fundamental software parametric design is an unadulterated kind of uh, um, uh, instantiation of systems and uh, software, you know, originally designed for systems engineering. BIM is a legacy of aerospace software that is directly designed from the kind of black box marker diagrams of, of TRW. And so the the kind of, um, but what was it, what was doubly fascinating, again, I felt like I couldn't, you know, I, you, could, you can't make this shit up, but somebody said that the, 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 the uh, systems engineering came back, it came back very precisely uh, appropriating the language and discourse of biological systems. So we weren't talking about systems engineering in the, in the kind of classical sense. We were talking about morphogenesis and all of this kind of stuff, but with a real, um, to my mind at least, a really deep and profound misunderstanding of the extent to which nothing in nature is optimized. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, optimization is a fundamental issue because uh, if, we, if you really talk to evolutionary biologists, nothing in their body is optimized. I was told you know, once by a biology teacher that five is the op optimal number of fingers. But of course, that's ridiculous because everything is adaptive. Our, 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 our hearing, our inner ear is, is part of the reptilian jaw, which you know, migrated up, uh, which means we can't eat anything larger than our head, but we can hear. I mean, the, the world is full of these kind of successive adjacent possibilities, which is where that term comes from. And everything in nature is fashion. And nothing is precisely optimized. And even in Darwin's lifetime, when people started talking about nature or evolution is an optimizing system. Darwin himself said, great is the power of steady misinterpretation. I mean, from the outset, this was a misconception about, about evolutionary uh, uh, processes. And from the outset, it was something that even Darwin called out. But as I said, the often the technological systems, the systems engineering approach, will always tend to want to optimize. Uh, uh, and therefore, the, this kind of useful uh, appropriate misunderstanding of nature, this kind of masked the, the digital, the, the systems engineering roots of parametric stuff and started to become what we optimize, you know, buildings, we optimize cities, we optimize, et cetera, et cetera. Today, whether it's IBM's smart cities program or, or you know, the, the, the tendency of technology to want to optimize real life situations versus just itself, 
is something that I think we have to resist. And that's the uh, 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 mass, it's very dangerous territory. And so that's, that I see all the time in school of architecture, uh, when people uh, mistake the ability of the tool to select one thing from all others for the fact that that thing might, you know, might be well suited to the actual situation. We're going to have to leave it there. Yeah. So we only get a meal tonight. So <laughs> thank you very much. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm thank you. Thank you.